All right, everyone. Welcome to the Iron Culture Podcast. Uh, this is our first episode where it's not just me and Omar, uh, you know, sharing romantic musings between one another. We've actually have legitimately important guests on, uh, and and we're going to be covering uh, the history of lifting to really give the uh, the foundation of this podcast, where we hope to help all you folks who love lifting to find a little more meaning and why you do it. And to do that, we need to discuss kind of the history of how we got here today. Uh, so I, I have with me uh, Dr. Dominic Moraes and Dr. Ben Pollack, uh, who, who are joining us. Um, and they are both physical culture experts. And uh, thanks for coming on, guys. Thanks for having us. Most definitely. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Awesome. So I want to, you know, take some onus off of you for being narcissists and do a little introduction of you, but then I'll hand it over sure. just so you don't feel that awkward whole like, hey, tell us why you're awesome thing. Uh, but we'll start. You, you're comfortable saying how awesome you are? Good. Good. That's uh, you, hey, if you want to talk yourself up, we have no problem with posting. <laughs> yeah, absolutely not. Yeah. Um, that's a big part of physical culture, as we'll probably see. Yeah. So. <laughs> So yeah, first we've got Dr. Ben Pollack. Uh, I think the first thing to state is that you are really strong. So, so Ben Pollack is a world record holding power lifter. I believe he's currently the first ranked in the world in the under 198 class for raw with wraps. I believe you have a world record total at around 925 kilos, which is just ridiculous. Um, and uh, beyond being uh, unreasonably strong, you're also... Uh, a man of academics. You got your BS from University of uh, Virginia and you did your PhD at the University of Austin at Texas studying physical culture and sports studies. Uh, and I believe you did your dissertation on Jack Lane. Is that correct? It is. Yeah. That is awesome. That is awesome. So you studied under Jan Todd, who I guess is uh, a strength legend in her own right from, from, from her era. Um, arguably was one of the strongest women in the world at her time. I think she was the first to lift the Denny Stones, and now she, like you, also became someone to uh, to contribute to the, the academics and, 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 and the study of physical culture. So just want to say thank you to coming on. Is there anything you wanted to add about your lovely self? Uh, man, I wanted to say thanks for having me. I'm really excited. I was excited when you guys reached out in the first place. And, you know, I definitely haven't done nearly as much in academia as Jan or as Dom, but I do, you know, I'm proud of the background that I have there and, and I hope I can share with some of it with y'all. Awesome. Well, we, we truly feel honored that you're here and we appreciate that. Um, and speaking of you, Dom, uh, so you, you're, you're a strongman competitor. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, so it's, I mean, so I feel like I was, like still am. I'm in one of those like flux stages, right? I, uh, you know, I was training for uh, Nats for Strongman Corporation in 2017 and ultimately just like wasn't paying attention to some things and uh, resulted in a bulging disc. And so since then, I've kind of like pulled back and really reevaluated a lot of things, my training, how my relationships, who I am, et cetera, just all kinds of things. It's been a really, really wonderful time. There's been a lot of growth in that. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I started really like my physical culture path or journey started like Texas high school football, right? Seventh grade. Right. Like I can, I can still remember I benched a hundred pounds. It's not like it's moved up a lot since then, but like, you know, that's what it was. Um, and then, you know, throughout my time, I walked onto the Vanderbilt football team when I was there. I really got really just like the bug hit me and I was a strength and conditioning coach when I got my master's degree. And then someone told me that you could study strength as an academic. And I was like, Oh, so two things that I really love, put them together. And so that's what brought me to the University of Texas as well. And I was able to study under Jan and, and Terry, you know, who was recently passed away. And so it was just, man, just a wonderful, wonderful time to learn both that on the academic side, but also just like that anecdotal stuff. We would, I mean, Ben can tell you the same thing. We'd sit around the table and just, I mean, to the point where it's just like, all right, we got to go. Like we got shit to do. <laughs> like we, we got to get our stuff done. But I mean, two hours of just being just, I don't know, just mesmerized by all the, all the knowledge that was that was in the Stark Center there it was it was a really fun time yeah we, we had the uh, the fortune of checking out the Stark Center and getting kind of a, a tour from Jan Todd just uh, just recently uh, with with me and the rest of the 3dmj crew and it really gave us a deeper uh, connection to to where we come from what's important and why we do what we do and I think it made us all think and also be grateful and there's not a lot of uh, better gifts than that and in my opinion that so I think it's a really 
really amazing place. Um, you guys met each other at, 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 at UT Austin, is that accurate? Did, yeah. Yeah. As Tom's awesome. telling these stories, I'm reminiscing because it was pretty, it was, it was fun times when we were there together. Very cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was cool because, like, when, you know, I was there for a year, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ben, but I was there for a year. Um, and, you know, I, I was in there. I was able to get a pretty good fellowship, like had good GRE score. And so that was, I was just, a, I was just so thankful about that. And then going there, um, it was really interesting because not as many people uh, trained, you know, and still kept up with their training um, when we were there as maybe we thought there would be. And so uh, when Ben came in, I was just really, really excited. As soon as we met each other, I mean, it was, you know, it was kind of like the heart emoji, like, ah, oh, right. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it just, it was really cool. Like we connected connected automatically we could almost I could almost feel like you know we're very similar in the way that we approach a lot of things and so my time was enriched at the Stark Center having been there like he pushed me as a person he pushed me as an athlete and he pushed me as an academic um, and he still does to this day so it was just really really cool we have a kind of a hit similar background of just trying to be great at a lot of things and um, striving to continue to push and deal with perhaps the uh, the uh, the uh, the other side of that that comes with it at times, but it's been it's been fun. It's funny, Dom's Dom's always the optimist, which I, I try to be myself. But while he's saying this, he's talking about how great it was when we were together. I just keep remembering how everything started to seem go downhill after Dom graduated. And it's like <laughs> all that wow. all that pressure just falling down on you. But all I heard was uh, Dom kind of espousing your relationship and the bromance, and it made me feel quite honestly, Ben, threatened. Because I know myself and Eric have a tight romance, and so I was just wondering the extent of it, because for ourselves, we also connected via physical culture, had some experiences, uh, went through some an existential crisis, honestly. I don't know if you guys have watched mm. this movie called Hereditary, um, but went through some things that we, we were clinging on to what we held dearly, and that was physical culture, so... When you talk about bromances, we can kind of understand that. I even noticed with you guys, you have like relatively similar facial hair. Like Dom, I see you got it like set up. You got you got that shit lined up on lock. I bet if Ben took off his Elite FTS toque, um, we would see like something kind of similar where you're both going for that like almost Wolverine-esque look. So, you know. I, I'll, I'll be honest. If it weren't, if we were here in person, my, my facial hair would pale in comparison to Dom's by a large margin. I, I just tell, so usually I do it myself, but I, I don't have, I moved recently. He was like, he was like, so the Leonidas look? And I was like, exactly, you know me. So it was nice. Yeah. I like how everything does relate back kind of lifting where you said even like, like the face hair, the, this, the, the quest for aesthetics, for appearances, you know, um, which is why it's going to be interesting talking about this particular period of uh, physical culture when we talk about the 1700s to the Eugene Sandow era. Because uh, some people now, I think, recently, via social media, uh, individuals posting about it, also just trying to take a look at what was possible. Eugene Sandow has popped up a lot, but people don't know the history of lifting or they don't know the real origins. And so today, starting with the 1700s, I think would be really cool. Yeah, I, I, that's exactly. That's, that's a good segue. Because uh, obviously, if we want to talk about the, the vaudeville strongman era, facial yeah. hair is really the, the best segue, I think. Uh, but but beyond facial hair, there's a lot going on in this period. I mean, this was a time when when lifting was literally a circus act, and I think I think it's difficult for us in the modern era to really understand what it was like. And that's what I really hope you guys can help us with, just to get kind of an idea of of, of what it was like to be a part of physical culture at that time. So can you guys? I don't know what what's the best way that you guys want to run us through, but if you can give us an overview of what well, what was it like in lifting culture in this era? So Ben, do you want to start off? Or you want me to? Sure, I can start off. Um, so you guys mentioned the 1700s, which is absolutely, I think, you know, kind of the earliest that you can trace that vaudeville era. Um, Charmian too, but I also think that it, you're 100 percent right when you say it's really difficult to us for us to relate to that time. And it's actually very difficult for us to even be able to uh, record that time historically because the records are very, very sparse. So that we know that some of this went on, but we don't really know the extent of it. We don't really know how popular it was. And, and we don't have enough specifics to be able to really speak authoritatively to the subject. 
But I think it's still really important to recognize that it started back then, because when you can understand kind of the roots of something, the very, very origins, the origin story, if you will, then you can have a better grasp on understanding how it became the way it is today. If I understand correctly, that's kind of the, the goal of this podcast, right? 100%. So, so yeah, so I think like the best way for me is to start really, really broadly, right? And we have to understand, you know, during the 1700s, right, like in the United States, we're just dealing with colonies. Um, in England, it's not necessarily even industrialized to that point yet, right? Like there's very much separations in class. And so we have to understand, first of all, that a lot of people just didn't have that much money or even free time because specialization in the form of, you know, industrialized economies hadn't happened yet. And physical culture very much came out of this idea of people having free time, right? Like we have free time to go to the gym and as such invest in our bodies in some ways as a commodity. Um, but at that time, the people who were speaking about that usually already had money, had some free time. There were people like physicians who understood, and in some ways I think they were part of a minority there. They understood that that health and, um, and, tr and moving the body health and exercise were very much uh, connected, especially when a lot of that came from this Mercurialis text that was republished, I think, in the uh, mid-1600s uh, that was Greek in nature and that, that idea of like mind and body coming together. So you had some physicians who understood that, but it really wasn't it wasn't a systematic form of exercise and keeping records or anything like that until, you know, early, I don't know, I would say maybe even like 1820s, 1830s, when people really started to get into that. You had some influences from Germany and, and we can, you know, ask more specific questions about that. But I mean, we didn't even hear too much about dumbbells during the 1700s. I mean, Ben Franklin talked about it a little bit. Like he said, yeah, that's that, you know, you should definitely use those here and there. But I mean, those weren't even, I mean, those are just like light things that you can hold on to. And we could really just characterize it exercise and physical culture at that time, especially in the U.S. and the Western side, as more just calisthenics. Yes, uh, and I think Dom mentioned the connection between movement and health. And I think the other thing you got to remember that we take for granted sometimes is the connection, or we don't, don't even think about it all, the connection between religion and, and health, the spiritual side of health that at that time in the United States is hugely important to people. Mm -hmm. And again, remember, at the time, we have a large Puritan population where your health, your spiritual health comes before everything else. And so, you know, if you're focusing on your body too much, that's considered sinful, right? Because you should be focusing on God instead. So to a large extent during this time, uh, the spread of physical culture was a little bit limited by that fact. I guess uh, the question to jump off that where you said it was not common at all how common were gyms and how many people were just performing any sort of physical activity when you said calisthenics, lifting weights? Is there any reliable figures from like the 1700s onwards to the early 1900s or no? Like even to, even to track the trend, if there was any trend whatsoever? Um, so if you're talking figures, it, it's yeah. very difficult. That was actually something I considered doing for my dissertation yeah. was a uh, – kind of geohistorical analysis of the spread of gyms beginning around that time. So, uh, you know, in the 1700s, I don't know of any gyms, certainly not gyms in the way you think of them today, public gymnasiums where anybody could come in and train and improve. Yeah. Um, it's not until the early 1800s that you start to see, and they're very, very few and far between to the point where, you know, today we can talk about some big gyms, right? You could probably name a handful like Westside um, that are very well-known gyms. Mm -hmm. That's really those type of gyms. That's all you had. So you had, for example, Oten Young opened a gym for boxers to improve their their ability to box. And so you have some of those type of things and we can find some pictures that show some dumbbells in the corner, right? So that's the kind of extent that we're talking um, very, very, very small. Yeah, and so that's that's super interesting. It really, I mean, you know, you could, 
you could think back to what has it been like the New York Athletic Club that came around in the 1800s. Um, I mean, that's one that you're just like, oh yeah, that's kind of like, like super training or West Side. Like that's where people went. But again, you know, you see drawings or pictures of this type of stuff, and yeah, you have maybe like some long glow barbells along the side, maybe some uh, small dumbbells. But more often than not, what you're seeing are ropes. You're seeing uh, pummel horses, right? You're seeing a lot of different ways in which people are, are, are essentially just doing those calisthenics and interestingly right i mentioned that german influence you know starting in what the 1800s when france was taking over germany at that time right early 1800s uh, napoleon is starting to really you know have that conquest well ultimately a guy named frederick ludwig jan right father jan as he's called he started he started this 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 idea of it was called Tunen, like T-U-R-N-E-N. -E There's a, I think it's ultimately the long form is Turnenbein or something like that. So, you know, with that in mind, he created these like calisthenics and where, whereas Ben talked about religion before, it was super interesting that he interrelated it and coalesced it with this idea of German nationalism, right? He felt that Germans were not, you know, being taken over by France. He wanted to keep that, hey, we have our own Germanness, right? And so with that in mind, he started making these clubs. And as, as time went on and German immigrants came here, you could see some of those clubs pop up in the United States. And that was a really like if if we can point to some really significant movements at the time that helped make those gyms, that was definitely one of them. I mean, so I'm in San Antonio right now and we're surrounded by places like Green, which is spelled G-R-U-E-N-E, -E, and then Fredericksburg. So there's those those really like big German influences and a lot in, in some different places here. And that's where you see that kind of like bodybuilding calisthenics that really start to spur other types of um, other types of, of movements like muscular Christianity which we can get into and stuff a little bit more so I don't know it's just it's just crazy how it all happens like that and these big 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 movements especially bringing those together and hey we can think we if we want to think about history helping us understand the present thinking about nationalism and physical culture coming together I mean let's just think about CrossFit and the way in which they do those workouts like um, you know Murph honoring right. like, yeah. those who have fallen right so it's just man it, it's history's crazy and one of the things I think Dom got at really well there was the idea that all this is kind of happening together, right? It, right now, Omar asked about quantification earlier, and I think that's another example of how it's very hard for us to have this historical perspective because back then, you know, quantification really wasn't a thing. That was more of a more of an attribute of modern sport than kind of these early developments. And it's kind of the same when you look at any of these different movements communication was so so different there was no internet telephone even the postal service right is not what we think of today and so to a large extent when you're talking about transferring information you're talking about going across the atlantic ocean right mm -hmm. so the communication levels and uh, a lot of the things again that we take for granted in the modern era just don't exist at this time and so it, it's much more of an amalgamation uh, than than we would want, I think. We kind of want to package things up very neatly, and yeah. it just doesn't work that well. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Um, it, it, it also, it's interesting, it probably creates some pockets of different uh, ways of lifting or expressing it. Were there divisions in, in, in the, the burgeoning weightlifting culture at this time, or was it so in, in its infancy that, that that wasn't yet quite a thing? So, for example, in, in, in modern culture, um, if, if you post something in a, uh, a bodybuilding or powerlifting centric social media space about CrossFit, you can almost guarantee that someone's going to open their mouth and make fun of CrossFit. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see in modern times that the, the divisions between different types of people who lift weights are very clear and uh, like at best cordial and often antagonistic. So or is, is anything like that going on at this time or was lifting just not even really seen as a specific culture yet or, or what was it like i'm gonna i'm going to say that the latter there is is more true if you will based on the evidence that i mean even even until you know even into the 1940s and 50s i mean still like training itself wasn't really something that was very 
popular for people, right? Like building your body was not something that people did. And as such, even creating, so that's one factor, keep the fact, you know, consider the factor that Ben talked about with means of communication being so different. It may very well have been that you have a gym in one place and that information isn't going to, isn't going to, you know, move farther than 25 miles for years. And with that in mind, I just don't think that there was opportunities or the world was just not in, in such a way that it allowed for quote tribes to develop yeah. in the, in the realm of physical culture. Yeah, I totally agree. I think if you were able to somehow to transport CrossFit back to the 1800s and you put it in New York and then you ask some dude from Virginia about CrossFit, he'd be like, what the hell is CrossFit? Right. You wouldn't be getting any type of uh, tribalism like you're talking about that, that, you know, is absolutely a modern phenomenon. So the only thing, though, that really does come to my mind that may like challenge what we're saying here is this idea of, you know, as time went on, especially in India, you know, you have Indian clubs. Right. Uh, you have Indian wrestlers. Um, and so maybe from a very much like a cultural standpoint. Right. Like that's what they're doing. But in, in, in a way, there's also those ties to like uh, nationalistic origin and religion, too. So maybe that speak as close to possible to the question that you're asking there. And again, right, like that's that's on the other side of the planet, you know, yeah, and right. so. There's not going to be until the until British starts colonizing things and we have some transfer of knowledge in that sense. That's when I think those things start to happen uh, a little bit. But then, you know, you start speaking about things like, um, I mean, without going like too far, ideas of, you know, people being lesser with colonists and stuff like that. Like that may as well have been like, OK, they're just going to do what they're going to do. And we don't believe that they're civilized, so we're not going to pay attention to it. I, I, I really don't know. That's just kind of hypothesis there. I think that's a great insight uh, that I wouldn't have thought of. But yeah, I think if you want to um, look at those sorts of things, you have to go to a global scale. Right. So at that time, any, any divisions existed just because there were different cultures that were separate, not because they had warring philosophies or anything like that. And that was very much an advent that probably began uh, once we actually had telecommunications, which is, makes a lot of sense. Omar, were you going to say something? Yeah, well, you mentioned the idea, and it totally makes uh, sense, as you said, that you did, because communication was not possible, that you would have individuals in their own spheres. But then, Dom, you mentioned something about uh, muscle Christianity or, or uh, exercise as it's related to Christianity, which mm -hmm. I used to joke about the gym being the muscle church, like it's a church, but it's just the muscle church where people go. How did that even operate when you talk about, you know, uh, muscularity or uh, training or anything like that and Christianity? And how was it organized? Because that almost sounds uh, tribal in the sense that if it's top down from a certain sect of Christianity to uh, believers or it's instilled from um, the belief system. Like, what was that all about? So. Ultimately, so this starts in about like the early 1800s and really bec it becomes popular, I think, in around the 1850s in England and then comes over to the U.S. and around like the late 1800s and becomes popular uh, in the U.S. So ultimately, it's this idea that became popularized. And Ben, you may know the originator of it. I don't know right now. Um, but ultimately, it's this idea of building one's body. And at the same time, like this moral edification, if you will, that, you know, in building your body, especially through team sports. So it was really interesting that muscular Christianity was very much surrounded by this team sport aspect. Um, and you can kind of relate that to like industrialization, organizations coming about, people having to work together, playing their roles. Right. So we can see how religion, how culture and all this stuff is very much so, can be socially constructed in nature. Um, so this idea that, you know, you, you build yourself through these team sports, especially work with one another and and as such you may be able to become closer to god but again it kind of goes back to those greek ideals of sound mind sound body now the idea is and you mentioned uh about india and the global phenomenon of uh lifting if we take a look at some of these unique sections so you talk about uh muscle christianity you talk about uh, things happening in india these separate areas developing on their own uh, in what ways, if any, were some of these lifters or these gyms or these locations ahead of their time? I think if they existed, they were ahead of their time. <laughs> I was thinking, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. 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 I, yeah and it, it's like a, it's a super simple answer, but 
I mean, that's the thing, like even, even today, right? Like if we think about people training and doing preventative medicine versus just reactionary medicine, I mean, yeah. so people were still doing it back then. And, and yeah, so I totally agree with Ben. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole concept of exercise was so novel and ahead of its time at this time, purely as a function of, you know, physical exercise came in the form of living day to day uh, in pre-industrialized society. So, and, and it's interesting now, there are, are, uh, are I'm thinking specifically of uh, Levantadores, the rogue uh, film that I think Chan Todd was a part of, where they have an entire culture of what seems like strongman to, to some westernized dude like myself watching it, but it comes from them replicating uh, farm-based lifting and manual labor and then making it into a sport in modern day. It just kind of shows you how, where it all came from, at least initially. And that one, that one to me is super interesting too, right? Because if we're talking about all these more abstract cultural, social types of influences, you can see mass, the idea of masculinity hard in there, right? I mean, again, you're lifting stones the same way that the manhood stones, right? That comes out of Highland Games types of, of, of lore, if you will. I mean, that is very much involved with that. So again, right, like the industrialization so that people can can just become more healthy. But on, on the other side of things, yeah, like lift these stones so that you can become a man, you know, and, and then, you know, wh whatever benefits come from that too. So it's, again, like Ben said, that amalgamation is just, I mean, it's hard in here and it's, you can get lost in it. That's really interesting. I think the whole the whole interplay with, with sex and gender is also really interesting. And, and one thing that I found very fascinating is that there seem to be some pretty well socially accepted strong women in this era. Like, for example, uh, Minerva, Josephine Blatt. She was in the, the 1800s. Uh, and that didn't, that didn't seem like an isolated occurrence, that especially as you get into the late 1800s, early 1900s, which we don't need to go that far. There were a number of popular vaudeville style strong women performers was that socially accepted it seemed like it was when i read about it which honestly just surprises me well remember that you're talking at that time more about an entertainer right than a, a strong man as we would think of that today and so i think in that regard women have been seen as entertainment unfortunately for quite some time they were more of a spectacle right than anything else so mm -hmm. I think you have to frame it a little bit differently if you're trying to relate it to the gender disparities in training environments today. So, right. Ben, what would that difference be, though, between a female uh, strong man, a strong woman such as uh, Josephine, versus someone like Sandow or whatnot? Where was he not also seen as a little bit of a spectacle when you said that she's also seen? Like, what are those differences, or what would those differences be at that time? That's a great question. And I think, yes, absolutely. But Dom is better, better versed to answer this than I am. So, so there's this book called The Circus Age. It was written by a professor who was at the University of Texas when we were there. I don't know her name, but it's fantastic. And ultimately, again, if we're going to talk about spaces here, a lot of vaudeville, circus era, like festival type stuff, there's this with this idea of place, like when people walk into a circus, or say you like go to Las Vegas to go see Cirque du Soleil, right? Like you're expecting this wondrous type of stuff that is very much detached from the real world at all. And in, and in doing so and seeing a woman do this, as a man, perhaps, who f fell into traditional gender roles at the time, to see a woman do these fantastic things, you feel a bit, quote, safer um, because you're in this place that is supposed to be for these ridiculously crazy off-the-wall things. And so they were, quote, accepted more because right. they were already insulated from the real world. At the same time, if you juxtapose that with someone like Eugene Sandow, People took him seriously. Dudley yeah. Allen Sargent, right, who was the first, he was the director of Hemingway Gymnasium at, at uh, Harvard. He was the first professor of physical education and was an, uh, a huge, um, played a huge role in actually just like solidifying that as a profession and as that as an institutional field. He dubbed uh, Eugene Sandow the perfect man. I mean, he took measurements of him. So whereas women were going to be kept in their space, we moved or, or pulled Sandow 
and that physique and what he did into the medical field that has long been looked at as, I mean, if you're going to look at Foucault and philosophers who say that there is so much power in the medical field, right? And so as such, people take that for better or for worse as, you know, almost like God's word or, you know, fact or capital T truth. And so with that in mind, that to me is very much a cultural or social uh, type of view or attitude that we look at when juxtaposing individuals of those statuses on a gender-based level. That makes a lot of sense. So, so while Sandow got the opportunity to train royalty, literally, and, and started an industry based on his body and uh, was something that many people, men, aspired to become, uh, the strong woman in this era was relegated to this fantasy land of the vaudeville act where she got to be different than what society demanded, and that was accepted because that was the entire purpose of the circus. I think that's really interesting uh, to to see that there was almost that um, that ingenuity that allowed these women to to do what they wanted to do and love and be accepted. I think that 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 speaks to uh, creativeness and how I think some of people's desire to be physical will find a way forward. Yeah, and so just to give maybe even more specific example of that juxtaposition. So whereas, man, I don't know who I think it was Sanduina, right? She mm -hmm. she like wrestled her husband and ultimately like he passed out. And then they had to bring him back to her tent and revive him. So that's one of the popular stories. So that's that's the interaction of the woman strong man with a man. Whereas you flip the script, I'm not I'm not saying that, you know, male, female binary, I'm so like forget about like let's not like chastise me if there are listeners there that are gonna do that, but give me a little bit of space here. On the other side of things, you have Sandow, who one of the popular stories of him involving with women was when he went back after one of his shows, I think in Chicago, he had women of the upper uppermost social class and he allowed them to uh, stroke his abs. Right. And they got just a clump, you know. And so from that standpoint, like you can see in those specific examples, the difference between, again, that fantasy land of, oh, my gosh, you know, she's a spectacle. That's so crazy. Like, can you imagine what people thought of her husband? Whereas he is very much masculinity involved. You know, he looks good. He can lift things. And of course, he's virile. He is sexual. Women want him. Men want to be him. And so that, that to me is, man, it is stark. Right. Yeah, that, that, that is a pretty significant difference. Um, so one thing I'm curious about is it, it's very unclear when I do my, you know, my very amateurish readings of this stuff of when the strongman acts were competitive and when they were they were just for show. And there are what I've read in the 1800s of inc incidences of strongmen competing. But was competitive lifting really a, a thing at this point or? Or what did that look like and when did that emerge if it was even in this era? So it's super interesting because often competitions at this time, especially in regard to, you know, those vaudeville strongmen like Louis Sears, Saxon, Sandow, etc., those competitions were at the same time almost entertainment in and of themselves. You had so many people vying for this title of world's strongest man, right? Or they understood, I mean, at the end of the day, my I'm almost biased in this lens or in this approach, but at the end of the day, everyone was trying to get by. Everyone was trying to make money, have a career. And as such, people understood what those titles meant and the entertainment behind it, the business uh, man portion of it. Whereas Sandow was suing someone who used the name Sandow, but just with an E at the end of it, right? Like he understood the power and the, the entrepreneurial aspect of that. So. When you have people, I mean, Sandow even himself, he goes in and challenges Saxon to a competition, and that's how he becomes popular. So those competitions were very much, um, they, they coalesced from entertainment to also, like, that's how those competitions started. And if you read, like, you know those competitions were, I mean, they were sketchy. I mean, they were super sketchy, and as such, like, you couldn't really believe your eyes for good reason, because maybe someone had put a really heavy dumbbell up there at first and tried to let people lift it, but in actuality, they were letting the stuff fall from it before they started lifting it, or whatever it was going to be. Like, had their little, they had their little tips and tricks throughout. And Dom, correct me if I'm wrong, but there were still some actual contests, like the one run by the New York Post Gazette, um, that were made. That we're talking late 1800s at this yes. point, but we're beginning to see some. 
Yes, definitely. You start to see some, like even even Sandow himself, right, created this, created a, a pretty large in England, like regional type of competition, and then ultimately like, had people coming together. Um, you didn't, though, there wasn't much structure to it, right? These papers were a big deal at that time. Um, and the idea of photographs, which helped Sandow become very popular, it was very, uh, every once in a while. Yeah, so I guess so competitive lifting is something that, that emerged probably after Sandow's era. But um, there, were, there were some other things that surprised me when, when reading about this era that I felt were ahead of its time. And, and one example I'll give was reading about uh, Professor Attila, as he's called. And, you know, we'll often, sometimes I'll make posts on Instagram about the, the, this era, the late 1800s. And someone will some, invariably come in there and then criticize me for being very scientific. And he was like, you know, I bet they didn't care about how many grams of protein they ate back in the day. But when I was reading about Professor Attila, and he may be an outlier, he talked about scientific training and rational thought and doing things in a very trial and error kind of scientific method progenitor kind of way, ask if you will. And I thought that was really interesting. Do you think there are are other things that, that were going on and maybe in more in the late 1800s that were uh, potentially would, would surprise people to hear about? As you can tell, like I'm super into culture. So this idea of, you know, the late 1800s, we're entering that, that industrial period again, especially in the United States. We have things like the telegraph coming about, right? You had the, uh, the locomotive, right? Late 1800s, those types of things are happening. And it was this era of, of science, right? And people began to, and that, you know, modern sport and keeping those records were coming about in the, right, Ben, like the early 1800s. And so like it's just this long-term type of push toward those quantifications toward the scientific method and really paying attention to those things. So I agree with you. Yes, it wasn't just Attila, but I mean, you can even look at Sandow stuff. You can look at a lot of entrepreneurs at the time or even uh, doctors who were prescribing. I mean, Graham, right? Uh, Alexander Graham, known for the Graham cracker, had his own, and this is the early 1900s, but you know, he had this own essentially like a resort type of place where people could go to like cleanse themselves, if you will. And so they were talking about, you know, you must rise at this time, take a cold bath now, make sure that you eat um, not more than three hours before bedtime, not less than three hours before bedtime. So, I mean, they were still keeping those types of records, um, I think, as much as they could at the time in the same way that we continue to try to go deeper and deeper and deeper and then realize, well, it's just consistency and effort, maybe some might argue, right? But that same type of stuff, right, was happening them in the context of that culture, technologically speaking, socially speaking, etc. So, yeah, it's just... Uh, History repeats itself like over and over again. Like I'll repeat myself saying that on this podcast. So, and I I would almost take an opposite view and say that you know rather than seeing a lot of science in what was going on, I I think you see the beginning of marketing mm. and the beginning of people positioning themselves as having this secret, whether it's a scientific secret or whatever, and the. The specific um, way that's substantiated depends on culture. And like Dom said, you know, at the time, science was becoming more important in culture. So the two kind of go hand in hand in that regard. But at the same time, that's kind of the lens I would view it through is that, okay, now we see people beginning to advertise their services and to try and get other people to take advantage, to, to utilize their business. And so for those reasons, yeah, you can find traces of things like scientific evidence, but I think if you're looking at the, the efficacy of them, again, like Dom, Dom mentioned Graham's uh, Santorum, is that Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which was the resort where you would go to help, well, I mean, you know, a lot of the times they were just sunbathing, right? Which is not going to cure tuberculosis. It's not going to hurt. But at the same time, you know, a lot of it is just this idea that, hey, we have a secret that other people don't, and this can make you healthier or bigger or stronger or more attractive or smarter or whatever the case may be. And, you know, obviously that's something we still see in, in fitness yeah. culture today. So this is the beginning of, of hashtag science, is, is what you're saying. <laughs> that, that's yeah. what I would argue. That's absolutely <laughs> what I would argue. Yo, is Ben, is that a title for an article? Because it sounded really good. Someone Hash should write it. Someone should write about that. <laughs> Sorry, bro, bromance inside joke. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. That, I love yeah. it. 
I was going to say that uh, the parallels that we see between even this era and modern times when you're talking, Ben, about the start of marketing and how pervasive it could be, especially when we take a look at today, social media, or even just gender roles, when you talk about um, basically it being uh, the circus, a safe space for a woman to perform then. And then basically it seems like guys' egos because, you know, they might be a little fragile. It's a safer space for them to witness this spectacle and not compare themselves. And we see this even today when we see a lot of accomplished female lifters, powerlifters, weightlifters, where they essentially, they kind of get shit on uh, much more than their male counterparts for their uh, relative accomplishments because it makes these fragile egos, uh, you know, uh, they're kind of getting bashed in. It's like, wait a second, this person is stronger than me. What's going on here? So question questions of manhood, masculinity, and all the, all these things being traced even back then. So many parallels between even this era, the 1700s to the uh, early 1900s to today. It's fascinating. For sure. So I think, I think it might be cool to talk a little about some of the things people are actually doing with, with the more accomplished strongmen. Like what kind of lifts were people doing? Obviously, the equipment was limited. It was probably dictated by that. But I notice when I look at some of these pictures, you see a slightly different development, uh, even among the, the, the so-called uh, you know, bodybuilders of the era. Like you typically don't see much pec development. What kind of movements and training were these folks doing at this time? So it's super interesting, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hone in on what you said about pec development. Um, and this, I, it's been argued at, at the lunch table at the Stark Center in a lot of ways that that was very much a result of the popularization of more of the power lifts, right? Because ultimately, people weren't doing flat presses, right, or um, you know, supine presses at the time that came in a little bit later when that bodybuilding started happening when people started doing odd lifts so ben maybe around like 1920s 1930s ish when that maybe stuff really started to play like a very popular role in people's training um i don't know the exact thing i'm kind of hypothesizing there so as such right a lot of what they're going to do are doing things that are overhead because let's be honest like it it, it and there's no no offense to any powerlifter whatsoever, but I mean uh -oh. to, to the naked eye, right? Like when you <laughs> when you put something over your head, right, and people can relate to that maybe a little bit more. It looks more like a body thing um, than laying flat and getting it handed to you and stuff like that. Like when you have to pick a weight up from the ground and then put it aloft, that may be from a more from an entertainment standpoint um more popular maybe that's why it you know you see the world's strongest man and those things happening and we don't really see powerlifting on tv as much anymore again again i haven't done the study on that that's just hypothesis from the stuff that i know so far i don't there's a lot that i don't know i'll tell you that much so i'll tell you this much if there were feathers in this room they would be <laughs> ruffled uh, and, and many a power lifter right now. Uh, Mine wouldn't. I hate the bench. I can't really squat or deadlift right now. So all I have, Dom, is the bench press. And you kind of take that away from me. No, no. I don't want to take it away from anyone. Like, I, I, hey, look, I love it. It's, I mean, look, like Texas high school football, man. Like, I was raised on the bench press and curls. Like, come on. It has a special place in my heart. So um, I'd also like to add to that. I think when you're looking at what the movements that people did, you really have to look at what implements they had access to. Mm. And so at the time, you know, most barbells had to be custom made, right, from a welder. So you weren't, you didn't have dumbbells or and odd objects unless you made them yourself, or you could use implements that were more common and more well known. And again, if you're performing, well, hey, it's a lot more impressive to lift a truck or or uh, I guess a horse-drawn carriage than it would be to lift this barbell that no one actually can relate to. Mm -hmm. So for those reasons, you don't see a lot of the traditional exercises that you see today. Machines didn't really start to come into play until the late 1800s. Um, George Parker Winship invented a backlift machine, which is basically, think of it as like a partial belt squat, I guess, hmm. um, That's cool. which was a very popular machine for strength development at the time. Um, and there were some other machines. Uh, the polymashion, I think is how you pronounce it, was one of the uh, early, early precursors to kind of like the universal uh, cable machine. Uh, but you really don't see even structured barbell exercises until the early 1900s when 
Alan Calvert and Bob Hoffman start selling them and they're available to the public. Yeah. Two. So one thing that I think is super interesting from this time that I pulled up when I was doing uh, my dissert, I think my dissertation or writing a paper. So Sandow created some pulleys and I think this is the first time that I've encountered um, weights being used for athletic performance. It was the New Zealand rugby team at the time had these pulleys on the boat that they were traveling on. So they were using Sandow's pulleys and that just blew my freaking mind. Like I was like, okay, strength coach in me is like feeling that. So it was cool. It was really cool. That's amazing. That's yeah. very cool. Oh, that's very cool. So, so there were some, some cool innovations happening here. I imagine much like uh, the lack of tribalism having developed, that they were not ubiquitous because people simply didn't all of that have access to it. You couldn't market it globally. So some people had access to machines and other people had no idea they even existed at this time. Yeah. And, and even then, like going into the I mean, even when you look at like Strength and Health magazine early on, you had a lot of people. I mean, it started in the Great Depression. So, of course, people don't have money. But I mean, they're just trying to fix axles together on steel bar and just trying to just get whatever iron they have. So you also have to you know keep that in mind that, you know, a lot, a lot of folks in physical culture started that way. Like they, they didn't have that much. They didn't they invested in their body because that's what they had, right? And as such, right. they have to just make do with what they have. And so it, it very much was that, that type of stuff happening. So I don't know. This is so cool. I think so too. And we've, uh, we, we've kind of danced around. We've done a lot of foreplay here. We've talked a lot about Sandow, but there's a reason why uh, this episode, uh, kind of this era that we're talking about in this episode ends with Sandow because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, there was a pretty big physical cultural shift with what Sandow kind of embodied. And no, he didn't do anything new. He made it really popular. So can we talk about that? Like what, what, what sign of Sandow coming and, and what, what change did he create? What was the big shift that was kind of embodied in him? Yeah, and then uh, just one thing to add on, the role of technology then where uh, Sandow, you know, uh, photography, the role that that played maybe in the popularization. Yeah, good point. Ben, do you want to start? Well, Sandow is your, your area of expertise, but I would like to mention that if we're looking at photography, really, oh, man, it doesn't really get popular or, again, accessible to the more average person until the 1900s. So even though it does exist, right, um, it, it's not something that's easy to do. And you're setting up some of these um, portraits uh, derogotypes, I think. I'm not good at pronunciation of a lot of these words, but, um, you know, you could be sitting for half an hour before you get one picture. So I'd, I'd caution against extrapol or connecting too much between Sandow and photography. But is that why, and this is an aside, is that why no one smiled back then? It's because <laughs> by the time that picture was taken, it was 30 minutes and they had to just hold still? I don't know, but that makes sense. Makes sense yeah. to me. Okay, well, that, 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 that's a new fact. I've created it. I like it. What I also <laughs> realize now is everyone in that era must have been even more jacked because if it took 30 minutes to take a photo, they would have lost flex the flex. that then. long, man. Yeah, right? you can't flex for 30 minutes. You're going to have an aneurysm. <laughs> so, like, they were even bigger back then, is what you're trying to say. That's what <laughs> I'm trying Pretty much, to say. yeah. Or at least <laughs> more lean. Yeah. Yeah. So when I think about Sandow, especially related to y'all's questions, again, it goes back to culture. And we're talking Victorian era. And in the Victorian era, uh, values there were extremely conservative. So let's think about, I'll use a different example. So in a sport like croquet um, that was very much for upper classes, women were, women were giving a little, given a little bit of power there. It was a, this liminal type of, of game, right, that really didn't mean much. But at the same time, it kind of did to the point where... When a woman, you know, like when you play croquet and you step on a ball and then hit it to knock someone else's ball out of the way, it has been argued that that if a woman did that to a man, it was metaphorical castration, right? Like women, women couldn't even show their ankles at the time, right? Because because of these types of values. So that's the era that we're living in. Then you have someone like Eugene Sandow who goes up there in a damn loincloth, right? Granted, he's not just up there like uh, Channing Tatum, right? Like, uh, what's the movie called? Magic Mike. Yeah, Magic Mike, right? Like, so it's not like Magic Sandow up there, right? Like, what he, what he does in order to make it so that he's not just this stripper, so to speak, and still have some class about it, is he essentially um, emulates uh, Greek and Roman statuary, 
right? He will even put powder on himself in order to emulate that. So, you know, you're thinking like these high class folks, oh, the Greeks and the Romans, ah, oh, yes. Like, how can this be wrong? They, they brought so much good to our world, et cetera, et cetera. And so he, he emulates those. And, and the biggest thing is that people started to, I mean, there were some photographs, people in, in maybe upper classes were able to get these and they had these kind of cabinet cards that were almost like not postcards, but almost like trading cards like we have for baseball players, except they're a little like fewer and far between. And people would have those. Women would have those in their bedrooms of a man, wow. with, you know, almost naked, right? And so to think about what that meant culturally for these people to have that and, and no longer, it, it, it changed the way that people viewed the body. It made it more popular for people to accept physique and the body. Whereas, you know, whereas before it was very much, hey, I have money, therefore I can eat and good for me for to look plump because people know that now I have money. You know, whereas Sandow was obviously not plump, right? I mean, he was cut up. And so from that perspective, you know, it really did start to change the way that people viewed the body from upper classes all the way to the lower classes. I mean, considering that he's training royalty, you know, in Prussia. So, I mean, it changed. Oh, man, it changed so much. And he's at the World's Fair doing in uh, 1893 in Chicago doing this stuff, right? I mean, so many connections there. If I'm not mistaken, I think like Tesla was even at that one too. I mean, just so much stuff. Florence Ziegfeld finds him and then puts him in this theater where he's doing this over and over and over again. And people from a high class are seeing it, talking about it, talking to other people in the same upper crust societies. So, I mean, that was absolutely huge. And I don't think it can be overstated. So this, this is really, I guess, laid the foundation for not only strength to become something that is exhibited, but now the body. Would, would you say that, that Sandow was truly the first person who uh, used the physicality of someone's aesthetic physique uh, as, as a display in the same way it had only been done with, with, with uh, implements and lifts? Or was he just the first extremely popular one who knew how to market it? I, I'd say he was the first who looked like a bodybuilder. Mm. Right? I mean, and I think that's an important distinction. Right. Yeah, I mean, right. there's, a, there's a reason why, right, like he's called the father of modern bodybuilding and that, that he's the trophy that they give at the Olympia um, in that way. Uh, it's, I mean, I think Ben would know more with his study of entrepreneurs if someone were to do that before but not be as popular. From my perspective, I mean, I'm almost like a Sandow fanboy. So, like, I would be like, oh, yeah, it's Sandow. So. When you said how cut up he was, I, I could feel it in your voice because he was cut up. Cut up. <laughs> yeah, said, yeah. Like, it Got that Texas in me. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I was actually not even thinking in the fitness realm, but I was thinking just in, again, if you go back to general entertainment, right, bodies have been spectacles for a long time, even if you're talking about things that are, are very different than how Sandow looked. And so that's why I think you can't necessarily make that claim. Mm -hmm. Right. But he certainly brought a, a body that had yet been seen. Yes. Uh, yes. Interesting. Very cool. And so, so now we're talking about uh, displaying something besides strength and having it being popular. Were people at this point training for different goals? Like were people training for hypertrophy or training for strength or were people just training? I don't even know if you could call it training, right? Mm -hmm. They were more like performing and that right. was their training because they do it so often. Yeah, I mean, so, and at the same time, you have to bring in this factor of, right? So like Sandow trains with Attila, Attila finds him, um, and Attila ultimately, if you look at pictures before Sandow worked with Attila and after, you can see that the boy bulked up, you know, like he, he got swole. So, um, for in those standards, uh, but then he didn't market that. I mean, he's selling his, he's selling his dumbbells that are five pounds that have springs attached to them. And ultimately the idea was, so they have a spring attached to them. You squeeze the spring. If the spring lets go, a bell rings to tell you that you're not focused enough. So I mean, if that's the focus that people are, are using rather than actually moving big weights, well, well yeah, like how, how are they actually training as much as they are for health? 
bring in also this idea that you have this, um, you have the medical field talking down about training because, you know, uh, basically talking about the built body and how that has deleterious effects on the body and this idea of athlete's heart and that, you know, training in that way and, and really pushing yourself to a limit increases the, uh, increases your heart, which we actually know, right? Like that is hypertrophy, but they looked at that as a bad thing. And so you have these attitudes that are ultimately making, again, training a very, uh, me, but it just wasn't looked upon as something that everyone should be doing. And you were definitely the minority and then you had to fight it. You had to fight it. Like you were kind of kooky if you were doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess it makes sense in that cultural context that they weren't promoting heavy weightlifting to the masses, but Sandow was certainly doing that. And it sounds like Professor Atteller, Atteller got him onto that. So Sandow was, he wasn't just a hot, sexy man guy, as I might it. put it. Hot guy okay. bit. Sorry, I never get the term right. But he was also incredibly strong. W would you say that's accurate? How did he fare against the other strongmen of the era? He, I mean, he never competed against Seer, right? I mean, I think he kind of. So got he was it. smart. Yeah. <laughs> he knew, yeah, I mean, he he knew the a, territory. Yeah. Like, at, at the end of the day, like, the, uh, the reason why I really, I don't know, respect him for who he was is. I mean, the dude was an entrepreneur. He knew marketing. He knew marketing. He knew what his name meant. He, y'all, he even made and 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 to give it up to uh, uh, David Chapman, who wrote the biography about Sandow. I mean, he, David Chapman, I respect him as a person, as a scholar. I mean, he went in and did so much research that provided provided really wonderful foundations on which we have been able to kind of build more on. But um, with that said, I mean, he made these, even made toys for kids that ultimately didn't become popular, but you would move the arms and the legs. And ultimately, if you did it enough, the candy would pop out, right? I mean, we're talking some really creative types of things. Those, uh, those dumbbells, right? Uh, I mean, he had cocoa powder that he made, like chocolate stuff. The, the list goes on. His name held weight, right? And as such, he's never, never going to put himself in a situation to ultimately decrease the uh, social capital that mm -hmm. went along with the name Sandow. And can you imagine if, you know, the world's perfect man is beaten by someone that looked like Louis Sear with a big old power belly like right. man that would have been that would have been disastrous for his reputation in his career especially when he has schools right like schools that he's created in places like boston right big big places where you know people who have money are going to become healthy so yeah i, I don't that's i don't i just think he was too smart for that so what, was there anything like a physique competition in this era or did that come only through sandow or, or others the first physique competition, I believe, was in 1908 through Sounds Physics right to me. Culture magazine, Bernard McFadden. Sounds right to me, yeah. It could have been 1910, but yeah, we're definitely past Sandow. Yeah, because I know, is, is I know the, Sandow the, put the great on. Competition? The great competition, is that what we're talking about? Well, so I, I know Sandow put on a competition himself, too, right? Like, he ultimately, again, had that, like, regional thing. But I really think, like, yeah, honestly, I'm 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 with Ben here because I can, honestly I can hear I can hear uh, Dr. Todd's voice in my head literally like correcting me. I think what Ben's saying is is the right one here. So nonetheless, it sounds like it was very early 1900s. Uh, yes. Sandow was involved or influenced. I I I, I, I could be wrong, but I think um, Bernard McFadden might have uh, been influenced by seeing Sandow at the World okay. Fair and perhaps by the the great competition that he held in the UK and then put on the closest thing to a physique competition um, because of Sandow is probably uh, the inspiration of his physique. And, yeah. and from what I hear, there was like hundreds of people that tried to enter this thing. It was reasonably popular uh, among, um, among as much as bodybuilding ever has been, I guess, at this time. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's a testament to those the increases in technology, right? Whereas we, mm. you know, just a few minutes ago talked about these nodes, basically, that were not connected. Now we actually have the ability to like send mail, to have print, to see this type of stuff, to see images of others in a mass produced periodical. I mean, whoa, right? For everyone to see the exact same thing and to ultimately have a collective mentality about something, that's next level stuff. That's next level stuff. And then to like bring those people together, 
uh, I mean, shoot, if we're going to talk about community, man, that sounds like the, the first seeds of it. You know, it's not, if not, if it didn't happen before, it sounds like a really great, like concrete way of that happening. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so I guess a question I have now, now that we've, we've gotten all the way up to the era, uh, kind of the end of the era with Sandow really changing the game is what do you feel, and this is, this is not necessarily an academic question, but your guys' personal opinion, has anything been lost from this era that you thought was a cool aspect of physical culture, or maybe not fully lost, but it's not focused on in the same way or that we don't, it isn't present to the same degree in, in the current way and in, in, in sphere of people lifting weights uh, that, that maybe we, we, should, we should think about or that might have had value. Ben, do you want to go first? No, I want more time to think. <laughs> cool. So, I mean, honestly, like, uh, you know, just kind of following what my heart's telling me in some ways, because this is a fantastic question, but I wish, I, I do wish I knew more about how they trained. You know, you, it's not, it, we haven't found them yet, you know, like training logs of these individuals and, and what they were doing and why and how. And, and to me, every person's a case study because I, I feel like in the modern day, we're learning more and more that everyone's different, blah, blah, blah. But for Sandow to, I mean, granted, I know genetics play a role, but for Sandow and these individuals to do some of the things that they did is just mind blowing to me. And I would love to just understand like the approach that they had to it. I would love to understand, um, you know, even just like take a look at, you know, what was your what was your month like? Like, what did it look like, man? How many times a week did you train? I feel like there's so much that can be gained from that. And then and then how that knowledge was how it was transmitted, like how it was shared between people, like the real knowledge, right? Not the marketed knowledge, not the stuff that they were trying to make money on. But how did you know, how did they talk shop? And what did they talk about? I, I really, because as y'all, as y'all probably know, right? Like you go to a conference or something and you listen to a presenter and if you take three good things away from it, you're like, all right, this was a win for everyone. But then, you know, you like go have beers with the strength coaches afterward and stay up until midnight. And you're like, that's where we're going to learn. Right? So I don't know. I guess that's kind of for me. If, if, if I had this wish, um, it, it would be, you know, those two things for me. I think mine's very much kind of biased towards my own experiences, but, you know, we're talking about this time, all the benefits that we have now of modern telecommunications. And man, I can't help but think all the benefits of not having those, about not having, not having the pressure and the, the uh, not, not just the pressure of the marketing, but also the, the information overload that we get from having access to everything so easily. It's mm-hmm. like... I think there's something really special about having to figure this stuff out for yourself. And while it's not always the most efficient way, right? It's better if you have a mentor like Professor Attila, you'll go faster. At the same time, you know, there's a lot of benefits to figuring out what works for you, not what works for somebody else, not what somebody else wants you to do. And on trying new things and, you know, focusing more on experiences than on presentation. Um, which again, you know, it's not what we've talked about during this kind of podcast, but it's kind of what I think we didn't talk about that, that maybe should have been highlighted. Hmm. Now, uh, Ben, if we are taking a look at things that maybe we've lost from this era, maybe when you said the simplicity or the lack of marketing or how you had to find what worked for you, are there some things when, you know, some individuals might uh, idolize someone like Eugene Sandow where they know it's like, hey, I could try and, uh, you know, aspire to be like this individual. Should we be careful not looking back with rose colored glasses at certain things from this era where we just we should be made aware of the monumental leaps we made and so forth? Oh, yeah. Don't get me wrong. Like, you yeah. would suck to live back then, dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there are certain aspects that we should. Um, just keep in mind, right? Be aware of not, not, I'm not saying toss social media out the window. I'm just not trying to say, be aware of the fact that, Hey, a dude like Eugene Sandow could build his body and achieve these things without any of these advantages. So when you do start to feel overwhelmed by that, maybe you can come back to that as kind of a reassurance that, Hey, you know, I'm going to be okay. Yeah. Jim Wendler said it, right? Like put yourself in a room for 10 years and like, you're going to be fine. Like just training. So <laughs> yeah. It's a really good perspective because I, I do think we get so caught up with, uh, and I see this a lot in, in kind of my followers because I promote a very kind of analytical, heavy science-based focus, but I'm, 
I find that I'm always the one pulling my the, my audience back to going, hey, 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 you know, progressive overload, commitment, effort, and loving what you do is 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 more than 80% of it. And I think um, that that's something where I see people, their indecision or their, their search for being quote unquote optimal before they even actually start putting forth effort. Uh, the planning stage uh, actually gets in the way of the action stage sometimes to a degree that's, I think, counterproductive. And I think that's definitely something we can learn from from looking back at this era where it's like, yeah, every Saturday I've got to do a, a max one RM overhead lift and then do it four more times for, for everyone else and then flex. And that's fine. You know, okay. like it'll be okay. Yeah, let's, yeah. Don't get me started on this. We might have another two hours. So like, don't get me started on the mental approach. <laughs> well, guys, I think, I think we, we, we've covered everything we wanted to cover. I want to give you guys both an opportunity to, like like Ben, you said, if there are any gaps in our discussion of this era, both what it means and just important events, I want to give you the space now just to cover anything that you, that we could have possibly missed. So I think, I think that one thing that we didn't talk about is this idea of like myth or mythos. Um, mm. And I mean, man, nostalgia and things being better before than they were now it's that's something that happens with every generation right and um we we often we often revere these individuals i'm not to say that we don't that we shouldn't right i'm not saying that we shouldn't but there's there's always this idea of like hey yo they were i mean they were like you and me. If history has taught me anything, right? It's just this idea of just like, hey, this was just a person. Like this was just a person. And in some ways, we we put these people on pedestals, um, and some of them put themselves on pedestals as marketing, you know, advantages too. But um, and in or, when we see these people, we almost look at them as like angels, or like Pecos Bill, right? Who who lassoed the tornado and and rode off and that type of stuff. But at the end of the day, like they were regular individuals, and in some ways. I think that can be extremely empowering to think that, yo, like they just like this dude came from nothing. And, and, and it's this, you know, maybe it's a bootstrap, you know, pull your pull yourself up by your bootstraps type of story. But I mean, to think that like, yo, like I can I have all this stuff like I, I can go I can go to Costco and like buy some meat, you know, like I don't have to go get mutton and drink wine or whatever, you know, whatever the case may be. Like I actually have drinking water, you know, I mean. Wow. And so from that perspective, in some ways, it, it can be just, again, empowering to think that, like, I have all these advantages. And uh, honestly, Eric, you started off by just talking about being grateful. And in some ways, I think that that can definitely, I mean, from a personal, just like me speaking, like showing my light, talking from my heart, like from that perspective, it just makes you feel that way. Like, man, like, yo, they were the shit. But at the same time, like they were just like you and me at the same time. So I don't know. There's just there's just something to that that I think is really special. Mm. Well said. Ben, you got anything? I think Dom's the expert from this era, and it would be tough to top that one. So I think that's a, a pretty good note to, <laughs> to wrap things up. Yeah, yeah. He, he got real on us there. So uh, yeah. I think, I he, think we all just need a moment. Today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, to close it out, I, I want to ask you both, why do you lift and what meaning do you find from lifting and, and being someone who who strives against the iron this one's pretty easy for me although i don't have a good like imagery right to describe it but i i never feel more alive than when i'm at the gym right when i'm pushing like heavy weights like max weights like that's literally the the best feeling i can think of is you know before during right after like a, a heavy heavy lift assuming you make it of course otherwise <laughs> after is not so good um but uh yeah it's it's really that moment for me man I, again i'm gonna get real with y'all and i think this is where ben and i differ in some ways like we're so alike but i think balance is balance is key in any bromance so uh just this idea of for the longest time and y'all catch me in like an interesting moment in my life like i was talking about like for the longest time i felt it was push 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 you know more and more and more and in some ways i feel like that kind of broke me a little bit a, a lot of bit and now i'm almost like i'm trying to not even go against the iron but be with it if you will and come to it as yo like i'm enough 
this strength will not be with me. Whatever strength I once had, like not even close to Ben, never have been, but that was part of who I was in the first place. Like I'm never on the first team, you know, like in the weight room. Right. And then went on to walk on to Vanderbilt and like, everyone's a monster, a beast, like seemingly just like granted gifts, granted everyone works really hard. Right. But seemingly just given these gifts. And so for me, it's like, yo, like you're, you're enough, dude, like you're enough go in there and express yourself through movement. Like in some ways, I think what Ben's saying is self-realization, but in the same way, that's the same thing for me, but just in my own way, through my own lens. And for me to just be able to move my body and, and almost, again, like have that almost like transcendent experience of like, yo, that just happened. Like I experienced flow. Like this is close to, to I don't know, maybe what like heaven might feel like. I don't know. Granted, I'm going out there. But to me, that is that is really like, where I am in my relationship with the iron right now. Yeah, it's it's not going to get any better than that. So first, I just want to say a huge thank you uh, for you for you both coming on, for sharing your expertise, for sharing what you're passionate about. Um, do you guys want to take a second to tell us where, if if anywhere, you'd like to share where they can find more about you if you want to share that more information uh, and just just kind of plug yourselves for a little bit? Sure. Um... All my stuff is under PH Deadlifts. You can search YouTube, uh, Instagram, Facebook, and follow me there. I write for Lead FTS, obviously. And uh, I do want to thank Iron Rebel and Granite for, uh, for their sponsorship. Yeah, I'm just Brainy Braun on Instagram. Uh, I don't really have as much of a, of a presence as Ben does, but you know, I, I'd love to be able to just connect with people and help in whatever way I can and help others share their life. So. Love it. Omar, you want to close us out? Yeah, I was going to say, I think both of you guys represent iron culture when we talk about physical culture very well in terms of both your motivations, your desire to share this information and spread it. And it's just fascinating to see how much, when we take a look at the 1700s, how much we have uh, progressed, but also in ways where we can learn things from this era. So I want to thank you guys, like Eric said, for being on this podcast, for being able to expound upon these uh, things that a lot of us maybe have felt, like the origins of why we lift or how it came about or the shape of things here in the West. Uh, and a lot of people might not know. So just have that opportunity. And then last thing I'd say is for everyone that's listening to this episode of Iron Culture, make sure to check out both Dominic and Ben. It will be linked in the description on iTunes. If you're on YouTube, it'll also be in the description to check everyone out. You can help us out by leaving a rating and review on iTunes. If you're on YouTube or anywhere else, leaving a like and leaving a comment below helps us out a lot. And like we said, because this is Iron Culture and we are attempting to unify everyone, even as Eric would say, CrossFitters, we're joking. We're not, we're not about them tribes. We're about breaking down boundaries. Uh, share it with a friend and uh, tell anyone else. We appreciate everyone for listening and we'll catch you in the next one.